Welcome to GRN, the Growth and Resilience Network, where every episode brings you targeted stories and strategies for professional and personal growth and resilience. I'm Steve Piscatelli, your host, coming to you from my headquarters, my world headquarters here in Atlantic Beach, Florida. I'd like you to consider two concepts today, resilience and thin places. Resilience, the, the term identifies the network, Growth and Resilience Network. Uh, you've read about resilience, you've heard about it, and probably have used it yourself. We want to dig deeper today. Is resilience a meaningful goal or just another faddish cultural buzzword? Easily attained, or is it an elusive hope? In thin places, in the Celtic tradition, thin places are those thin places, thin areas between heaven and earth. One blogger described it as, quote, a world view in which heaven and earth are in general separated by a considerable distance. But some places on earth seem to be thin in the sense that the separation between heaven and earth is narrowed, end of quote. So today I'd like to take the metaphor a bit further. You see, finding resilience, at least for me, often seems like a never-ending search for that thin place, that often elusive spot between what seems impossible to endure and that place of peace, calm, and rejuvenation. The thin place could be a kind of safe place for emotional well-being, a place that encourages hope and meaning in our living. Today, we want to dig into those two concepts, resilient and thin places, by taking a look at one man's journey and his 35-year calling and experiences that gave him the opportunity to help hundreds upon hundreds of people find their resilience, find their thin places. Born and reared in western Kentucky, Don Lynn found his way to Georgia State University where he studied business and began working in the banking industry. And following his graduation, he continued working in the banking industry for six years. So there he was with a job, you know, a degree, a wife, a house. And he said he looked at his wife one day and proclaimed, we're never going to leave. Well, one year later, he entered the seminary where he would earn his master's in religious education. That was 1978 and he never looked back. Following 10 years as a parish minister in Jacksonville, Florida, in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, Don moved into clinical ministry with a major hospital in Northeast Florida. And he remained there in the role of chaplain until his retirement in 2015. So from banking to ministry, and now sitting here in the GRN studio, let's welcome the Reverend Don Lynn. Don, welcome, my friend. Good morning, Steve. I'm glad you're with us. I got to ask you before we go any further, I said clinical ministry, and I keep on getting clinical ministry and pastoral ministry mixed up. Did I use the right term? Well, we do pastoral ministry in a clinical setting. <laughs> that's the differentiation. <laughs> okay, that's good. Indeed. Indeed. All right, let's start. Um, <clears throat> For a little context, uh, hospitals are places we think of for physical care. Now, as a chaplain, you provided spiritual and emotional care. So give us some context with that. Maybe it's even looking at a typical, if there is such a thing as a typical day. Help our listeners understand what this means and why it's important in a hospital setting. Is it the same as having a spiritual advisor? Well, um, sort of, but not yet. Uh, years ago, when I first started my training in this uh, clinical setting, uh, a surgeon shared with me that he was all about taking care of the human body. And then he said that in his training, he was starting to be aware of the human inside of the body. Mm. And it became uh, a part of my understanding that my focus was on the human in the body, not the body so much. So we were one of the few people as chaplains who would go into a patient's room to not cause pain. We don't give shots. We don't uh, give bad news. We don't hurt, touch, mm -hmm. uh, except to hug and to hold mm -hmm. and to receive the tears. Um, so it's interesting as a pastoral care provider that we are, if not the only one, few that do not cause pain in a hospital setting. And when you go in, and you and I in our pre-podcast discussion, 
uh, we, we had talked about this a bit. If you came into my, if I'm a patient and you come into my uh, hospital room, uh, as the chaplain, would you immediately say, let's pray? Oh, Lord, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, to minister, you, you sort of with people, you don't get religious. Matter of fact, the last thing you want to do is talk about church. Really? And religion. You talk about the person and their needs. Uh, it's not about you. It's about the person in front of you. Wow. You try to help them understand who they are and what they're about in this sometimes painful setting. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's interesting. So it's spiritual, not religious. And do you find that from the standpoint, is it that it could be controversial, um, that people get turned off by this? They think you're proselytizing? I mean, is that the reason for that? Well, you, you tend to want to be there for the person and not for their views of who you are. So uh -huh. you tend to avoid arguments when you don't talk about religion. Mm -hmm. So if you want to dispute some kind of doctrine that you think I might hold dear, <laughs> that's in a different relationship. That's not why I'm there. Right, right. So if I can help you more focus on your coping skills and what makes life meaningful for, for you in that present moment, then that's what I'm about. I'm not about talking about the best preacher or the best Bible or those kinds of issues. <laughs> and then to the term of resilience, would you say that's what you were helping them with? Or is that too cliche, too trite? Well, it, it is too. Once you get the dogma out of the way and you start focusing on relationships, whether the relationship is with your God or with your spouse, uh, then you can start dealing with the issue of hope and purposefulness, mm. which is, to me, the, the essence of resilience. Wow. I have a reason to bounce back if I have a sense of hopefulness about my future. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, then what's the point? Yeah, it's really interesting. You, know? you mentioned the word relationships. And, and um, a lot of what I do with, uh, in higher ed, uh, we talk about student success, and one of the first principles is establishing a relationship. Certainly. And when I talk about, you know, beyond that, in workplace, relationship and that's right. the first thing you go to and that is powerful yeah. and, and folks uh, yeah obviously most of you don't know Don but he is excellent at doing that he makes somebody feel very at ease um, he's ready with a laugh which is always good especially <laughs> I would think in a hospital setting at times um, so you deal with the patients but tell me about did you have a relationship of resilience, maybe finding thin places, which we'll get to, for the staff, the nurses, the doctors. Were they part of your, your ministry at the, in your spiritual care? Well, to, to make a parallel thought about ministry, most people are aware of the parish minister, the church, the building, that kind of dynamic. Uh, so in a way, you could view the hospital uh, staff, medical staff, clinical staff as my congregation. Mm -hmm. And the people who come as patients are those who come on Easter and Christmas or who don't show up at all. So, so if I can take care of, of the nurses and the doctors and be available and appropriate with them, then there's a strong likelihood that they'll help me know what patients they perceive need a caring touch mm -hmm. or need a, a present moment to be with someone who can listen to their hurts and pains. Right, right. So, yes, yeah, so I try to take care of the nurses and the doctors first. And, and that primary. Sense, sounds like they're serving as an intermediary. They can. They can. They can, they right. Can. But that's not the sole purpose because uh, grief accumulates, and all of us experience grief and live with grief. And at some points in times, grief gets too heavy. And so the doctors and nurses need to talk, the X-ray techs, all of them have their own pains that they, they, they bring with them to the workplace. Mm -hmm. I read um, recently that there was uh, one reliable um, uh, estimate that on average in the United States, there are as many as 400 physicians committing suicide each year. Um, I, I had never thought of that, never read that before. Um, is that an accurate thing from what you know? Is that, um, or did I read something that was just sensational? I don't, I think that it would be fairly accurate. I don't know the numbers, but the sense I have is that uh, nurses, uh, x ray technicians, uh, handlers, those folks would more readily talk about their issues and pains mm -hmm. rather than the physician. Uh, the physicians that I, became aware of and, and came to know uh, across the board. 
could, could not uh, afford failure. And it would be difficult to allow themselves to feel a failure. And so they were all, well, I shouldn't say always, that's mm -hmm. an absolute, but generally um, they, they would be more closed. They would not be as open and vulnerable to sharing their concerns and hurts. And when you get closed up and you carry all your grief inside of you, uh, what does one do with that over time? So I would not be surprised. Mm -hmm. I'm pleased to say that a growing number of uh, doctors, at least in my experience, were more and more open to engaging Mm. And maybe they were becoming aware of how painful it was to hold it all in and to not share and to not be vulnerable. And, and coming back to your earlier comment on relationships, I'd have to think when they're willing to be vulnerable with uh, one Reverend Don Lynn or the chaplain, there's been a trust established already. You they, yes, yes. At, at least with the concept that the minister is trustworthy. Yeah. And then get to know the person. Can can uh, can value what you have to say and, and appreciate the power of what you have to say and how you feel. Certainly, trust is at the core of it. I would think. Yeah. And 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 since you mentioned vulnerability, it was on my list to to tap into today. Do you think that before someone can be resilient, or whatever term we want to use here, before they can get into that thin place where they feel comfortable? they have to have a sense of vulnerability? Does resilience require vulnerability? And how did you help people connect with their vulnerability? Well, when a patient is lying in bed and they're looking up at the ceiling and they're in pain and they cannot stop that pain, then there's some sense of vulnerability, that some sense of helplessness. And that's the opening door mm -hmm. to them understanding that life is beyond their control. And if they ever come to that realization, even briefly or in a shallow mindset, then there is that sense of vulnerability that can open other understandings and then can look at, okay, what do I do with that? Hmm. How do I cope with that? Why does it have to be that way? I think the other way that chaplains do, at least I found it helpful, is that I openly admitted that uh, the world is beyond my control, you know? And uh, so when they hear you admit that you're vulnerable, that gives them permission mm. to share their own vulnerability, at least as to the point that they understand it at that point in time. Yeah. And it, it, which reminds me of something else you had said to me in previous conversation, which was that when when we talk about being spiritual, and I, if, I, if, I, if I misspeak here, please correct me, but spirit, uh, being spiritual broadly is about meaning-making, understanding boundaries and structures. Is that part of this coming to grips with the vulnerability and that you can't control everything and wherever that leads? Certainly, how you make sense of the world and you, that you live in, how do you understand relationships, the why and the whereof, and... Most people have some uh, belief that there is a reality beyond our knowing. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then what do they do with it? Uh, for example, the scripture tells us that God is love. Okay, wonderful. Well, so what? Hmm. What does one do with that understanding and how does that impinge upon your living? So the boundaries you create to identify and to be self-aware and to then engage others around you appropriately Mm -hmm. Surely that's uh, all a part of resilience. That's a part of being vulnerable and engaging. And does that lead to this this thin place? Can't uh, you were the one who introduced me to that. And I've just really, yeah. I, I've since been uh, really um, interested in that. It, yeah. this, I, I like the concept. I'm not sure I totally understand it. Sure. I think I do. But maybe you can speak a little to that if you sure. feel comfortable. To, to me, in its simplest form, the thin place, if you hold two balls in your hand, and you allow the balls to just gently and briefly touch each other. At that brief one point where those two balls touch, that is called the thin place. That's where the two worlds connect. So for me, early on, uh, my greatest thin place was to be running on the beach. I was a jogger uh, in the cold weather where no one else is around, just me, God, and the seagulls. <laughs> And I'm, I'm jogging, I get into that zone where it doesn't matter where I'm going, I'm just jogging. And God would speak to me loudly and clearly. Mm. And I could get a sense of who I had become or who I was in that moment. But a think place could be in, in a chapel. It could be 
out on your back porch sipping a glass of wine, which is one of my favorite activities in the <laughs> evening hours, just just to hear the birds chirp, to hear the wind blow through the trees, and just to be at peace. Yeah. So a thin place could be in a crowded room or it could be out in the middle of a desert. It just depends on what meets your needs at mm. that point. And it could come and go. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you can sort of also not engineer it, but you can anticipate it. You can plan. You can go to those places that bring you joy mm. and peace, mm -hmm. a safe place. And a safe place could be with your spouse in, in a room watching television where your spouse is asleep on the couch and you're just watching some mundane TV program, but yet you're okay. Mm. And, and that's where you're safe. Wow. You can be who you are. Or you can be in a crowded subway, I suppose, where everyone's doing their own thing, but they're leaving you alone. Right. you got your own so, space. So where you are safe, I think, is the principal notion of that. And, and you mentioned your jog on the beach with the seagulls. And, mm -hmm. and it brings me to this idea, again, when, as I understand, when you were in your position as chaplain, that was pretty much a 24-7, 365 position. You, you took occasional vacations, but sure. you were on call. Right. And to me, that this seems so unsustainable. So, you know, and there are people listening to this. I know that in their lives, they've got a pace that appears to be unsustainable and might be. Mm -hmm. So how did how does one ha person handle that responsibility? And can you be as specific as you can? Was it just go for a jog and you were cool? But there had to be days when you felt like screaming at the seagulls. <laughs> <laughs> and days I did. <laughs> and to God. But I'm glad to think that God could take my screaming. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How did you handle that? Uh, how did you stay sane? Always on. We, uh, before I began this chaplaincy training, I did, not, I did very little reflection. And we train our pastoral care providers on this model of action and reflection. So you do something and then you reflect upon it and you keep that cycle going and that just becomes a pattern. And that helped me to develop a, a way to take a break and be reflective and thoughtful and mindful. Mm. And that led me to my thin places. That led me to a way of more appropriately coping. Because uh, when you leave in a, a very emotional, intense experience, it's not fair to go to the next patient and just walk in the room and say hello and start anew. You need to get away. Mm. And so uh, you would take a 30-minute vacation with a cup of coffee in a, in a small, quiet room or outside the building on some seat somewhere mm -hmm. just, just to get away, to reflect, to think, to uh, take a deep breath. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, to me, was more often the coping sk uh, style, skill, mm -hmm. uh, during the work that they were And it worked for you? For the most part. Yeah. For the most part. The other part is that uh, my wife early on told me, when you come home, don't bring all your baggage home with you. <laughs> if you do, leave it at the front door, which was wonderful advice. And so I would take my baggage, and I would go run on the beach, and she would say, good, I'm good. glad you're running on the beach. <laughs> you know, you sound, um, as you're talking, we live in an era of life coaching right now. The concept has become ubiquitous, so no matter what you pick up. Um, would you describe your career as a life coach? Uh, I'm sure there's overlapping between what a life coach and a minister seeks to accomplish. But uh, my, my role as a minister in the clinical setting was more about uh, helping people understand who God is, was in their lives. Mm -hmm. And then from that perspective, uh, approach uh, the emotional and the mental in the lifestyle in contrast to examining the lifestyle and the emotional and trying to find God in all that. Mm. So I think the perspective from which I would approach a relationship would be somewhat different than how we might understand a life coach, although there's a wide variety of Correct. life coaches and how they come about, who they are, and what they do. You're right. Yeah. The other part I think that would be different is that we train our chaplains to get a sense of who they are before they try to help others understand who they are, and we're very strong on that. Mm. And I don't know that life coaches have that same emphasis and training. They may. I, I just right. don't know. And some excellent ones, I'm sure, do. Oh, that's yes. an excellent point. Sure. Somebody, I'll say from time to time when I'm talking to a, a group of higher ed 
um, educators or administrators, especially the, uh, the instructors, is that um, it's great to share your personal stories with students, but remember the students aren't there for your group therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You got to know why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. It's so powerful. Yeah. I got what, before we get to a wrap up, there is a, I'd like you to relate something because it, it also was something that struck me when we were talking earlier. You shared a story with me about standing quietly in the back of a patient's room. Mm, yes. One day, and the reaction of a nurse to you in that room at that moment, and it spoke to me on a number of levels. So if you would yeah. just briefly tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, years ago, uh, there was a, a nurse whom I did not know except to see her in the hallways, and we found ourselves in the same room of a very emotionally dynamic, stressful situation. The patient was passing, family was grieving, emotional, very intense. And I was standing in the back of the room sort of out of the way, watching, uh, trying to be careful as to what I did and how I did it. And, and she was put off by that. She thought I should be uh, uh, hugging, engaged, uh, crying with patients, saying the right things, doing the right things. Mm -hmm. And it sort of ticked her off that, that I was so engaged. And she told me later on and over time, because we found ourselves in those situations with some frequency, she said that I, I was present, but I was not intrusive. I was silent purposefully mm -hmm. that I was assessing. And she said from that, she learned to be silent and mm -hmm. hopefully not intrusive. Yeah. And, um, you know, you don't want to rush in where angels fear to tread, but oftentimes we find ourselves having to do that. But in doing that, you don't want to be destructive. You want to be present and mindful, attentive. You want mm -hmm. to wake up and appreciate what's really going on and who really needs your help. Yeah. Uh, it, I thought that was a powerful story. On one level, it's also it's a reminder about assumptions. Uh -huh, sure. It is a reminder about assumptions. And she was making some assumptions at that Certainly. time. Um, and then when you, you talked about it, she got to know you, and now there's an, a new set of assumptions, a new set of awarenesses, basically. Yes. And um, that, that's a great reminder to all of us that we see people sometimes, and my gosh, that person doesn't seem to be paying attention at all. But that person is processing. Yes. It's just processing different than we might. Sure. Yeah. Sure. That's, that's really powerful. Indeed. All right. So as we bring it to a close today, Don, uh, you've covered a lot of things. We've talked about resilience, your idea of thin places. What do you want to leave them with that they can use for their lives, for their growth and resilience? Um, you know, how can they find and nurture their thin places? Perhaps a strategy or even a question or two they should consider. <laughs> Well, we chaplains don't do anything. We're more about being with people, so we don't have strategies as such. But what I have found that works for me is that I've learned to read biographies of other men and women who seem to be awake and aware. And that has prompted in me new thoughts to think, new ideas to understand. One of them is to simply wake up, pay attention, but it takes a lot of work, a lot of emotions to be at attention all the time. But that's one of the strategies that you don't assume, that you be awake, aware of people around you, of your own issues, mm -hmm. that you take time to reflect, to be thoughtful, prayerful, Yeah, that you don't rush into every situation. And what you were saying earlier about the importance of taking action and then reflection. Sure. Action, reflection, sure. action. And so many times, again, in this 24-7, um, 365 micro-message world, we mm -hmm. end up taking action, taking action, taking action. Yeah. And, okay, what do we do? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and it's okay to mess up. Yeah. <laughs> Just next time you don't have to mess up so badly, maybe. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, as, uh, yeah. Learn something from it. Yeah. All right, folks. So let me leave you with a call to action. Uh, as you, uh, as soon as you can, take a moment. Think about what Don shared with us today, and this is powerful stuff. And and I would say also, as you experience your week ahead, be mindful of those thin places that help you understand your more essential self. Be mindful. Is it in front of the TV? Is it? walking on the beach? Is it standing in a subway? Where is it? And it might not always be in that same place. Be mindful. Maybe jot that down. Maybe write that down just to be mindful. And it helps you 
begin the process of reflection. Um, the thin places can be those places that present a certain clarity, and they might present themselves when you're not even looking for them. Um, so, Don, thank you again. This has been wonderful. I always learn when I'm around you. I feel better, and that is, uh, uh, I'm not just saying that because you're sitting here. And I thank you, listeners. Um, without you, there's no Growth and Resilience Network. Uh, visit my website, stevepiscatelli.com, for more information about upcoming conversations on the GRN and about my programs and other resources for your personal growth and resilience. And while at my website, uh, I've made it very easy for you to sign up for my email and news, uh, newsletter list, and I promise I will not spam you. Really, I will not do that. Uh, so until we meet again, either virtually or online or somewhere in person around this great nation, this is Steve Piscatelli from my headquarters, my world headquarters here in Atlantic Beach, Florida, reminding all of us to choose well, live well, and be well. Bye-bye, folks.